I invite you to give you to the reading of God's Word as it's found in Colossians chapter 3. We'll be reading verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to fast forward then to verse 10 and read through verse 17. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters, and He lives in all of us. Does anybody think that's good news this morning, that, that it doesn't matter where we came from, it doesn't matter what we've done, it, it doesn't matter, that the only thing that matters is Christ, and that if we say yes to Him, that He lives in us? Yeah. Praise God. Since God chose you to be the holy people He loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds, all, binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness, fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Would you please pray with me? God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is inspired not just in the writing, but again in the hearing. And God, we ask that you would speak by your Holy Spirit, speak into our lives your truth so that we might be changed, so that we might grow closer to you, so that you would be glorified. And God, we will thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, two weeks ago, before uh, Miss Irma so rudely interrupted us, uh, we started a series on forgiveness. How can I forgive? And you know, if, if there is anything in this world that requires supernatural empowerment in order to accomplish, it is forgiveness. <laughs> and if there is anything in this world that is so difficult to do, and yet is so necessary for the, the health of our souls, it is forgiveness. And so this series really is intended to be entirely practical, that it's not just theory, it's not just philosophy, that, that this, this is really about you know, how can we cooperate with God, how can, we, how can we receive the power of God in our lives so that we might forgive? Because, obviously, Jesus takes this very seriously. As a matter of fact, he says that our forgiveness from God is tied in with our forgiving one another. Matthew 6.15, if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Jesus takes this very seriously, and if you think about it from this way, uh, from this perspective, the perspective of the gospel it starts to make a lot of sense, because at the heart of the gospel is forgiveness. Jesus died for us. Why? He took our sins upon himself so that we can be forgiven, so that we can be restored to God. So forgiveness is at the heart of the gospel, and so there's this real disconnect. If we are a people who, who, have, who owe our lives to the fact that God has forgiven us in Christ Jesus, then there's this real disconnect. If we've received that great gift of forgiveness, that ultimate gift of forgiveness, there's a real disconnect if we don't extend that gift of forgiveness to others. A real disconnect there. And so, um, and so we are getting after this, I, I hope, in what is a very practical 
way. Because, listen, if anything, we should be known as a people who forgive. That ought to be something that we are famous for. So it's practical. And, and this is the reason why we're in the book of Colossians. Because Colossians is about, it's about the glory of Christ. It's about understanding who Jesus is. That He is the Son of God come in the flesh. This is who He is. It's understanding the majesty of Christ. And it's understanding, Colossians is, the enormity of what Jesus has done for us. And in light of those things, in light of who Jesus is and what He has done, how then am I to live? It's really what Colossians is about. Because the Gospel is not a theory. The Gospel is not a ticket to heaven. The gospel is a doorway. Jesus is a doorway into an entirely new life. And that new life begins the moment we say yes to Jesus. So the series is practical. It's about how we live, how we engage the power of God in our lives so that we can forgive. And the other thing about this series is that, that really the way I see it is, is it's really all aimed at the heart. Because it's from the heart that really everything flows. From our thoughts and our intentions to our words and our actions, it flows through our hearts. And so this is aimed at our hearts because if we're going to be a forgiving people, listen, we can't just have tips and tricks and things. We actually have to become different people. And the only one who can make us different people is God. And He changes us from the inside out, from our hearts to our thoughts and intentions and then to our actions and words. And so this is directed at the heart. And now as we kind of zoom in on today specifically, what we're talking about, where we're kind of zooming in today is on having a higher goal. Having a higher goal for our lives. That is, our hearts, our intentions, our actions being set on a goal that is higher than the things of this earth. The scripture says, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Set your sights on the realities of heaven. Another way to think of the realities of heaven is that they are the character of God. You remember what we prayed just a few minutes ago, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everything in heaven is as God intends. It flows from the very character of God. Everything is determined by the character of God. And so, when we hear realities of heaven, we can also think the character of God. The character of God. We read also, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Now, uh, obviously, we have to think about some things on earth, right? Like, I'll just give you an example. I sort of wish that more people thought more deeply about their driving. I just, I'm just going to be honest about that. Like, I think if people thought more about their driving and what they're doing, I, I really feel like we'd all be better off, right? So this is not about that kind of surface-level thinking, like, I have to think because I'm doing my job. I have to think because I'm driving. It's not about that surface-level kind of routine stuff. This is about deeper things. This is about, what is the passion of my life? What is the, the affection of my heart? What is it that I want to give my energy to? What, where do I want to direct my life? Because what the Scripture says is that because of what Jesus has done for us, because of the new life that we can have, should have, must have in Him, our sight should be set on the things of heaven, on the realities of heaven. So really, today, in part, is about a heart examination for each of us. What, what, is, what is the actual goal of my life? Not just what I want it to be, not what I would like it to be, not what I would like to tell people that it is, but functionally, what is the goal of my life? See, I, I, I've sort of learned this about Scripture um, over time. What, what I think God has shown me is that, you know, it's really great to read the Bible, and it's really great to examine the Scriptures. But our lives won't change until we let the Scriptures start examining us. You, you with me? Until we have the humility to allow the Holy Spirit through the Word of God to lay us bare and say, Jeremy, this is something that you've got to work on. That we've got to work on together. Jeremy, I, I'm not so sure that your actual functional goal is the reality of heaven. And so this really brings us to our first question. That is, what, what is the goal of my life? I think that's where the Holy Spirit wants, wants us to get traction. What is it actually functionally that I'm going after? What is it functionally that I'm giving my life to? 
And listen, I, I, I think those of you all who know me know this about me, that this isn't a guilt trip thing for me. This isn't about me um, <laughs> like saying, okay, you all really need to think about heaven more. Or you're not going to be a good Christian. Okay, let's sing a hymn and go home, right? That's, that's not what I'm trying to do. Because I, I really believe the Word of God. And, and I really believe that knowing God and trusting God and walking with God and obeying God really is the path to life. I really believe that. And so this isn't about guilt tripping our way into being able to say that we're good Christians. This is about having the life that God wants for us. Because I am convinced, I am convinced of this, that the life that people really want, whether they know it or not, understand it or not, want it to be true or not, the life that people really want, we could describe as the life of heaven. It's what people really want. The Scriptures tell us that God has, He has placed eternity in the human heart. And what I mean by that is not just that people want to go to heaven when they die. What I mean by that is that people really want to live the realities of heaven now. That is what we are most hungry and thirsty for, is to live into those realities now, to live that sort of life now. So that really leads us to our second question, what is real life? Because that's what people want, right? They want real life. Our Scripture says, your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, I, I know, I know that there are people who will say that, that heaven is a fantasy, right? That it's a fairy tale, that people tell each other, that they tell their children, and so that they make themselves feel better. I know that there are people who say that, but actually, heaven is more real than this world. Heaven is more real than this world because this world is passing away. And heaven will not pass away. Right? You with me? Not only that, heaven is more real than this world because we are made for the realities of heaven. Let me just take one example with you. Um, and I, I think this is so cool. What we have seen with Harvey and now with Irma is these disasters bringing out the best in so many people right? Like just yesterday I noticed this. We're driving around and this lady's car breaks down and I remember just a few months ago seeing a similar scene and man, everybody is trucking by and trucking by and honking and get out of my way and you know, instantly like I didn't even have to stop. Instantly there were two cars stopped and they were pushing her car off the road, right? It just, there, there is something about this sort of thing that brings out the best in people. We see regular people become heroes. We see people giving sacrificially, loving each other so well, and it makes them feel what? <laughs> good. <laughs> it makes us feel good when we serve people, when we give. It makes us feel good. It even makes us feel good to see people doing good, right? If I could just see it, it makes me, why? Why is it so deeply satisfying to serve? Why is it so deeply, transcendently satisfying to give? Why? Because that's how we're made. <laughs> this is not complicated. It's how we were made. Do you know the Scriptures tell us that God made us in His image? That God made us as little image bearers to bear the glory of of the God who, when he comes in Jesus and we see him in high definition or 4K or what, whatever is the, like the best thing now, right? Is it 4K? Okay, 4K. You see, right? Jesus comes and we see the heart of our God in 4K, right? We do. And what do we see? And what do we see? We see that our Savior says things like this, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is who God is. This is the God who made us. This is the God who made us in His image. Jesus comes in the flesh, and what do we see? We see the greatest act of self-sacrifice, the greatest act of love, the greatest act of service that has ever been known. That has ever been known. This is our God. This is how we were made to be. And so Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heaven has broken into this world. 
It has come near. And so now you can have it. And meaning, not just you can go to heaven when you die, but you can actually touch and feel and know and live out the realities of heaven, and you can do it now. So the Scripture says this is what real life is. Put on your new nature and be renewed. Be renewed in what? In the image of God. Be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. And become like Him. See, after this life, we're going to stand before Jesus. And if we are covered by His grace, then we will see Him face to face. And we will, the Scriptures tell us, become like Him. We will be fully and finally renewed after the image of God. Just like that, in that moment, right? Now, those who want to live the real life, they will be those who will strive for that life now. You know, people worry. They worry about whether or not they're going to go to heaven. Sometimes people worry about that. And, and I think here's, here's a great test. Here's a great test of our hearts. Do you want to go to heaven? Like, I think that's a great test to know. You know, am I going to go to heaven or am I not going to go to heaven? And the question, I think, is do you want to go there? Because <laughs> if you want to go there, guess what? God wants you to go there. Do you want to go there? And not, listen, listen, not just do I want life extended, but do I want one day to stand before Jesus fully renewed? Do I want to live out all of eternity in His presence? Because if we want that now, then we would strive for that now in our lives. That would be the trajectory of our lives. We would set our eyes, our hearts, on the realities of heaven, and we would do it now. Does that make sense? And so the question is, do we want heaven? Is that something we want? Real life, the Scripture tells us, real life is to know God. It's to know things about God, to understand God's character, but even more than that, it's... Real life is about having intimacy with God. It's about walking Him, walking with his, Him and, and, and knowing His presence, the blessing of His presence and His love, delighting in God. And not only that, real life is being renewed. Being renewed, being reshaped and remade after the image of Christ. To be the way that we were made to be, that is real life. Paul says, therefore, as he's carried along by the Spirit, Put on your new nature. It's time. Put on your new nature. Become the person that you were always meant to be. There's this guy in the early church. Uh, his name's Stephen. And Stephen is, um, listen, he is such a man of incredible faith and devotion. He has such a heart for the Lord and such a heart to serve. And, and he has this heart to know God and to walk with God and, and to make the gospel of Jesus Christ known. And you know what happened to him? As he knew real life, as he knew God and he walked with him and he was being renewed, you know what happened to him? He got heaven in his bones, right? Like down deep, he got heaven. How do we know that? Well, there came a day when Stephen was persecuted, when he was wrongly accused. And there came a point when they started, the crowd started beating him to death with rocks. And you know what he did? Even, even as they were hitting him with stones and killing him, you know what he did? This is what he said. He prayed to God, and this is Acts chapter 7, verse 60. He said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Now somebody explain that to me. How you were unjustly accused, and you were being unjustly executed and you pray to God for the people who are in that moment killing you, Lord, would you please forgive them? You explain to me how somebody can do that apart from the radical, transforming grace of God. And you notice, you notice, didn't you, that these are virtually the same words that Jesus prays over those who put Him on the cross. Heaven has gotten into his bones and his life is looking so much like Christ that when he is being stoned to death, he prays the prayer of forgiveness that Jesus prayed over his persecutors. Heaven has gotten into his bones. So the last thing is, uh, how can I have it? 
How can I have this real life? Like, practically speaking, what do I do? If I want to set my sights on heaven, on the realities of heaven, if I want to know this life where I know God and I'm being renewed, how do I actually do that? Well, I want to bring us back to the Scripture where we read, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom He gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Friends, what we how we do this is we fill our lives with the truth of Jesus Christ. That's what we do. How is it that the gospel speaks into my life? What does the gospel have to say with how I treat my family? What does the gospel have to say with what I do with my body? What does the gospel have to say with with what I do with the resources that God has placed in my hands? What does the gospel say about every area of my life? The fact that I am not my own that I am bought at a price. What does the gospel have to say with about every area of my life? And then secondly, we read that we would help each other. That we would help each other. <laughs> that through teaching and wise counsel and things like life groups and Sunday school and, and Christian friendships and mentors, that we would help one another apply the word of God to our lives. That we would help one another. And not only that, that we would worship together (laughs) <laughs> that we would fill our minds with the goodness of God, that we would, we would come into the presence of God together knowing that the Scriptures are true, that where He says that where two or three are gathered, He's in the midst, right? He's here. The Scriptures are true where we read, if you draw near to God, He will draw near to you, friends. The presence of the Lord is in this place. Heaven bends low when His people worship. And if we would open our hearts, not harden our hearts, if we would soften our stance toward God, not stiffen our necks, then we would know heaven being poured out in our lives. And we would want it, and we would want it all the more, and we would set our sights on it, and we would know, therefore, what is really life. May it be so, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you please pray with me? God, our Heavenly Father, we do thank you. that Because of your grace, We can know what it is to be restored to you. And that because of your grace, we can be transformed, renewed, reshaped in your image. That we can actually start to be the people that you have made us to be. So enable us, Lord, to know, to touch, to feel heaven, the realities of heaven. So that we might keep our eyes on the realities of heaven, not the things of the earth. So that what drives us, what gives us passion what we want to give our lives and our energy to is who you are and who you've designed us to be. And we'll thank you for all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.